You're listening to a recording of a show broadcast on radiopod.co.uk. All facts and figures and reference to topical content were correct at the time of broadcast. All competition entries for this broadcast have now been closed. To find out about future live shows or listen back to other recordings of shows, log on to radiopod.co.uk. This show was first broadcast on Sunday the 13th of July 2014. You're listening to Radio Pod, free pop-up radio shows about you and your life. One more minute to our next live show. Downloading show information. Hi, my name's Jen Nicholson. And my name's Rob Smith, and today we'll be discussing the different routes to getting your own book published, from self-publishing through to getting a deal with an established publisher. Over the next hour, we're talking to people who've already had their work published, find out how they did it, and other tips and advice during the writing process. Why not email us with your question, or if you already have a book share your experience with us studio at radiopod.co.uk without your contribution the show can't happen so to take part email studio at radiopod.co.uk leave your phone number or skype address and we'll call you back that address again studio at radiopod.co.uk Although we've made every effort to broadcast a show to a professional standard, we accept no responsibility for the language or opinions of our live callers. This show has no age rating. Sponsored by EqualDating.co.uk Radio Pod. Get into it. So this show is for you if you've written a story and are unsure how to get it published. And during the show, we talk to various authors who have self-published. And we also have top tips from a lady who has had a book deal for a number of years. So how hard is it to get a book deal? And is it really the best option for you? Many self-published authors prefer to have the control of self-publishing. But how do you go about it? And once you have your book, how do you promote it? Also, what's best, traditional book or ebook, or, or even both? Even if you haven't finished writing your book yet, we also have a few writing tips to help you. Over the next hour or so we talk to authors of thrillers, romance novels, science fiction, factual books and children's stories. Our guests tonight are from all over Newcastle, Bournemouth, Nottingham, Derbyshire, Wiltshire, London and even Las Vegas. And don't forget you can get in touch with us. You can email studio at radiopod.co.uk or text us starting your your text with the letters L-J-N-E-H and send it to 602 triple seven texts are, st- are charged at your standard rate and of course if uh, you, you didn't get a chance to write all of that down all the details are on the radiopod.co.uk website of how you can text and various other ways you can get in contact as well including skype and um and email um so also on the website there's a poll that we're running this evening which is uh, basically what's the best route to publish your book is it self-publishing or a deal with a publisher so take part in that vote and we'll keep updating you throughout the show on the, the results of that so far so that page on the website is radiopod.co.uk forward slash live so to our first phone call on the phone is martin coleman martin tell me about what you've done then i've self-published three children's books um and i've recently been published um uh, having written several rewritten several bible stories for for a free app that's available on ipad so if you could tell me, uh, you know, not only about your children's stories, you know, kind of what they're about, but also how you went about um, getting them published in the first place. Uh, I've been writing stuff all my life. I've always written uh, poetry and silly rhymes and things about people that I've known and worked with just, just to entertain people, really. Um, I've written other stuff like uh, like game shows for Butlins and that kind of thing in the past. Um, comedy sketches, comedy routines, and that kind of thing. So I've always loved creative writing, but never done anything majorly serious with it, or, 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 or you know, really seriously tried to get it published. But in October 2009, I uh, was almost 48, and I decided to take myself seriously. So I sat down and started to write a children's story. Um, originally, I. Basically, I was washing up, looking out the window one day and thinking, do you know what? If I write a Christmas song and send it to Gary Barlow and he makes it a hit, I could be a millionaire every single Christmas. <laughs> and I'm sure a lot of people have uh, have <laughs> thoughts like that. But, you know, it was just one of those things. I, I kind of thought that I would write a, a Christmas song and I thought that the, the only subject that, that sprang to mind that hadn't been written about in a Christmas song was pantomime. So 
So I started off with a great big list of everything that I could possibly think of to do with pantomime. I wrote down Aladdin, Cinderella, he's behind you, oh no you don't, etc, etc. And uh, from this list I started to write this, this um, what I was hoping to be a song. It was very, very quickly, obviously, turning into a story with rhyming verses. And uh, and I was there. I was doing it in the kind of style that that, I, that I've always done it. But um, this, I, I wrote it over three months, and uh, it was it ended up being called the King's Panto, and it's a story about a bossy, grumpy king who, uh, who, who shouts orders at everybody around him. And one day in the middle of summer, he uh, asks all the lords, lords and ladies, and the barons and the dukes and the dames to come to. Uh, to come to his um, quarters and he asks them, his chambers rather, and he, and he asks them to go out and find all the characters from pantomime because he wants the pantomime putting on to, uh, to keep him entertained. And he doesn't want one story, he wants all the characters from all the, uh, all the nursery rhymes and, and the fairy tales. And so off they go um, in, out into the land of pleasant dreams and they, they go off to, to find these characters and, uh, and uh, uh, ultimately, the show goes on. Uh, it, it, it's, they, they haven't rehearsed. They've got no script. They, 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 uh, they they're, nothing's ready. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an unmitigated disaster. Everything goes wrong, and um, the, the, the king's life is then in danger with the, with the giant coming after him, and uh, the, the king gets jacked. Day, and that's all you need to know now. <laughs> that's, no, honestly, I, I was so intrigued. Listen to you. It, it sounds like the story that I, I would read to my kids. Uh, you know, because they love things like the Gruffalo, and, uh, and in fact, there's a lot of stuff that uh, Julia Donaldson writes. Uh, things like Jack and the Flum Flum Tree, and uh, there's a few others as well. And, um, and and they all have an element of rhyming to it. And and, and honestly, it gives the story a lot of pace. Um, but but that sounds. I mean, I obviously haven't read your story, and and, and I'm, I want to try and get a copy now if I can. Um, but it, but it, it kind of sounds like it's the same sort of you know style and you know fun and. And, and and the rhyming pace to it as well, which which sounds like um, it should be a good story. You, well, you, I, I do draw try me and fun. And the other thing that I do, and in fact, when I'm when I'm writing, and and as we've already mentioned, I've, I've now self published three books. They, they all rhyme. But what I what, there's two there's two things I should mention here. One is that when you tr- when you if you write a, a children's story and you want to get it published, you shouldn't really write it in rhyme because publishers don't like rhyming stories. Now. We know you've just said the Gruffalo is hugely successful and it's in rhyme, but that one got through the net, believe me. Um, publishers don't like rhyme, and the reason for that is they don't translate into other languages. Of course, and publishers yes. Publishers want, want to sell their books uh, as widely as possible, and so they, they you know, I, I'm shooting myself in the foot every time I write a rhyming story, but, um, you know, when you're when you're a creative type of person, you, you don't you don't try and be creative because you want to make lots of money. I know I made that analogy about being a millionaire every Christmas, but it's it's kind of a half joke about writing a song. But but you, someone who paints a picture or or takes beautiful photographs or writes songs or or, or novels or whatever. People are creative because they need to be creative. They're not. It's not a financial gain that they're setting out for, is it? You know, it's it's something that people feel the need to do. So, true to myself, I, I ignore the fact that I probably won't get published because I'm writing in rhyme, and I just carry on and write in rhyme because that's kind of how I like to do it. Um, and the other thing that I was going to say on this was that. I break rules in all sorts of ways uh, in that I don't target my books at a certain particular sort of age group like three to five or seven to nine. You know, uh, I just write them and I just write them in a way that I believe will appeal to children. But I also like them to be enjoyed by adults because there's nothing worse than sitting down to read your child uh, their favorite book. Uh, at bedtime and you know that it's a dreadful book 
the child, because they're young and innocent, doesn't realise that it's dreadful. Yeah, no, I totally um, agree. And there are some wonderful, wonderful books out there, and, and don't get me wrong, but um, there, are, there are a few out there that, that you, you really wonder how they got published. And, um, and, 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 and parents, I think it's really important that if the parent enjoys the story and can do all the voices and get into it and have fun with it and, and find it funny as well, then the child's going to enjoy it all the more. And the feedback that I, I get is, is children of literally all ages enjoy my books, and that's so satisfying. You know? So, yeah, I, I, I looked into self-publishing. There are websites. I'm not going to start naming them. Um, but if you look into it, if you Google it, you will find websites where you can self-publish. They do have some distribution power, um, and that's probably a positive thing. But it's kind of known as vanity publishing, and I didn't want to go down that route because everyone's paying, you're, you're paying the premium price per copy. What I wanted to do was publish my own books, was print my own books so that I've got them here and I can take my books to schools, I can take them to festivals, I can take them to people's houses, I can go wherever and, and go, look, here are my books, I will read my books to you and do you want to buy a book kind of thing and um, so that's, that's what I did I, I found a printer I got a, uh, a great deal we have a good relationship he's, he's printed all three of my books so far uh, which is a total of four print runs um, and um, you know I, so I pay a, a much smaller price per copy um, which enables me to, uh, to use the profits to print more books and that's how it's worked. So literally, um, since 2009, that's what, um, five years ago, um, I've, I've done four print runs, I've got three books out, I've never taken a penny profit, I've never paid the illustrator because I can't. Uh, you know, every bit of money has gone back into printing more books and indeed developing um, uh, uh, an e-book and an iBook uh, for the King's Panto as well. And, and if, uh, you know, somebody came up to you for the first time and says, look, I've written something, um, can you give me one piece of advice? What would be the, the best piece of advice you can give? The first thing that I did when, I, when I'd written the King's Panto was I, I put on Facebook, I just, I just finished writing my first children's story. Lots of people said, oh, let me read it, I want to read it, can you send it to me? And... I thought, no, I, no, I don't want anybody to read it. I want to get it published, and then they can read it. Um, and then I thought, no, do you know what? This is brilliant. I've got, I've got friends and people that I know who will read it and read it with their children. And most of these people are pretty intelligent, and I'm sure that most of them are pretty honest. So I can get some really good help here and feedback. And so I sent it. I, I spoke to some of these people or, or messaged some of these people and I said, listen, I will send you this, but I want you to be absolutely brutal. Please, please criticise, rip it to shreds, tell me what's wrong, read it with your children, tell me what they like, tell me what they don't like. And uh, I, 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 you know, I ended up getting some fantastic feedback from these people. You know, it really, really was was helpful. And, and that's kind of the other, the other thing that I'm saying that to illustrate that is, um, you know, get 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 people to be completely honest. You know, if you're going to go and enter the X Factor, you know, make sure the right people are telling you the right thing and it's the same with writing. Brilliant. That's a great bit of advice. Uh, listen, Martin, you've talked about the King's Panto. What are the other two stories, just briefly? Second book I released a year later, and that's called The Greedy Crocodile. And I, I wrote that back in 1994. It was six verses long. I'd always loved it and, and it's always been special to me so I, I added another six verses I made it a 12 verse uh, it's a short story it's a shorter story than, than the other two um, and that was released in uh, 2000, uh, uh, 2012 and uh, so King's Panto was 2011 Greedy Crocodile 2012 and then I wrote the Not Quite So Good Princess um, which is kind of a sequel to The King's Panto. The King features in it. He's now married. He's got a, a, a wife who's the queen, and they've got a little daughter called uh, who, who is the good princess, and she is twice as good as gold and never does a thing wrong, is always doing everything to help other people. 
And uh, one one night, very, very early in the morning, she gets up and starts causing havoc all over the town. And uh, everybody's angry and comes to the palace and, uh, and the king and queen uh, get up and they're all confused and, and uh, everyone's complaining about all these incredible, incredibly bad things that the princess has done in the town. And um, once again, uh, you have to uh, buy the book to find out what, what happened. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's, um, that's what yeah. I was going to lead on to. I was going to say, and where can we get these books? Because they sound brilliant and I'm going to look into getting them. So where can we get them from? Uh, well, my website is colemanbooks.co.uk. That's Coleman with an E in the middle. Uh, and you can also uh, find them on uh, Waterstone's website, on Amazon. Um, most good bookshops will will be able, if you go into a, if you go into a bookshop and ask for any of my books, they can find it on the system. What what you do is you you log all your book data. Uh, with a company called Nielsen, this is another thing that you learn when you self-publish, uh, and, and Nielsen book data, then put that data out on the system so that anyone can find uh, all the information, the ISBN numbers and all that kind of thing with your book. So, um, so they can be found anywhere, but if you come, for example, direct to my website, uh, you, can, you can add instructions to merchant and uh, ask for your book to be signed to your child or whatever, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's slightly more personal um so yeah martin uh, martin thank you so much for talking to me today and giving uh, your story about uh, how you, you got your books published uh, my pleasure and thank you very much indeed for having me on the show and uh, good luck with everything that's martin coleman and uh, as, as we just mentioned a second ago you can get his books on the waterstones website or via his own website martin coleman uk. remember all good bookshops not the bad ones all the good ones uh, keep your emails coming in uh, hello to Harry Riley thank you for sending us an email uh, during the show uh, Harry says new writers need all the help they can get each new milestone in this epic crawl gives them more confidence to continue well done for helping to smooth the way through this rocky path so how about it then Rob you ever fancied putting pen to paper and becoming published author do you know I, I'm one of these people who um, I come up with all the ideas mm. and I write some of the ideas down the backbones of the story um you know some of the character names and then i kind of stop there i just don't go any further um oh. i don't know what I, well, I i kind of i don't get bored i just think um i don't really have the time because then my mind's onto something else yes. which i'm doing and that's that's my problem you're an ideas man yes i guess so and also because i i kind of think on the level of wouldn't this make a great movie <laughs> so I, I skip the book part and think no oh, i just want to make a movie just get on with it so um i did write one when i was um at, at school i never, never had it published or anything but i wrote it at school um mm-hmm. it's called my brother is a monster um <laughs> and i was inspired by anything <laughs> my brother <laughs> funnily enough. um i was about 14 i think and i won't go through all of it but it starts off with my brother is a monster his name is terry fye he has big hands and big feet too and one big pair of eyes Ooh, so there you go and, uh, and quite recently I've, I've come up with an idea of the story which I, I can't I don't really want to share with you just in case I okay. actually do take the time to sit down and write it properly are but you going to write it and post it to yourself I could do yeah I'm I mean, sure no one else does it yeah copyright the idea <laughs> um, but all I'm going to say is, is it's a cross between James Bond Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and Harry Potter James Bond Chocolate sort oh of. sorry I've, I've gone somewhere else James yeah. Bond and Chocolate <laughs> <laughs> But I think it's a good idea. Um, but you know, it might it might not be. But I don't know. I might might, might take time to sit down and write it. Properly. I started a book. I was just about to say. What about you? Yeah, I started a book. I got the title. Yeah. Yeah. What is it? <laughs> I can't tell you that. Oh. But that's as far as I got. Oh right. Okay. I was like, I'm going to write this book. I don't know. Got the title. <laughs> just don't know where I go from here. <laughs> I'm. I think I'm like you. I kind of. I've got the ideas. I've got the things that I know I'd like to do. But I just. It's a lot of dedication that it i is. just don't know if i've got the concentration levels really no no i know you mean it, it does take a lot and you know there are a lot of disciplines that you've got to kind of teach yourself to be able to sit through the process like my brother for example mm. uh, he writes uh, and then his son came along and all of a sudden everything goes out the window because he hasn't got the time or the energy yeah. you know so it's difficult it really is difficult one day one day you never know <laughs> one day I'm, I've got our next budding author um, on the line right now uh, mm-hmm. via Skype uh, his name is Stephen Paul Blanchard who wrote his book called Getting Synced 
Uh, he wrote it between 2010 and 2011 and is also in the process of writing his second book and got ideas for his third one as well. Uh, as I said, he's on Skype via, uh, in Newcastle uh, and I uh, asked him how he found the whole process. Writing it in, in hindsight was actually the easy bit. Actually sitting down and writing it and, and getting it all finished, that was relatively easy and I was just like, well, what am I going to do with it now? And it was it was actually my message who just said you need to publish it this is a really good book you need to go out and get it published so you i kind of went down the traditional route of finding trying to find agents and publishers and all this kind of stuff and they just for whatever reason they wouldn't touch you with a barge pole you either you are known you have no track record it's not the kind of thing they would do or whatever and then i just stumbled on stumbled onto this this idea of of self-publishing but for me it wasn't about making money and i think anyone who gets into the writing gig saying they want to make money is doing it for completely the wrong reasons you get into writing because you have a story to tell you want to write it you want to share it with other people and if you're lucky enough to make in my case even 40 quid um from the sales of those from the sale of that story then you're really really good and it's the more people read it the more good reviews you get the more traction you get as a writer the more excited people get about seeing your next book and that's that's the position i'm in at the minute because um i've got so many good reviews and so much good feedback off the first book that everyone's dying to see the second one and that's a really good position to be in as a writer but you don't get it you don't get in there to to go in there and make money that would be that would put you in a really bad and a really miserable position i think at the end of the day when i first published the book I just published it and didn't really think anything of it, thinking, oh, yeah, everyone's going to go out there and read my book because, you know, everyone likes me. And it's not been that case at all. So the promotion of the book is, is to be honest, is actually harder than the actual physical writing of the book. Um, so there's, I've seen people go on there and do like um, video trailers for their book that they do, so they put it on YouTube. Um, people have got on, on their like their own Facebook writers page. That's something I've done. You get on there a Twitter account as well. Um you know, and the usual things when you're when you're talking about things on Twitter, you're linking like little hashtags so other people can promote it. And what I've done recently, because I've I've finally talked myself into getting my second book finished. And just as like a little motivator, I've kind of started to republish my first book. Uh, but just on like um on like a blog page. I'm doing like a, a chapter every single every single week. I publish it every Sunday, and then linking that onto onto the Twitter accounts, onto Facebook or whatever, and that's really taken traction. So like like a little teaser, basically, so people yeah. can see an extract of the book, think, "Hey, I quite like this. I want to read more." And then yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna be publishing the whole thing, and the big thing is with this, you know, it's free, you know, but it's gonna take a good year, I think, for every single chapter to be published. So if people are getting into it and they can't be bothered to wait around for the for the next chapter or whatever, they can just go out and buy the actual physical book. Um, but you know, it, it depends how they want it. It's almost like serializing something in a newspaper. That's the way I've approached it. And again, it's it's not to get it's not to make money out of it. It's just to get people to realise that I've written this book and to put on those friendly reviews and spread the word around. The other way. The, uh, the other thing that I've started doing recently because I'm, I'm, we're seriously looking at me going full time as a writer towards the end of the year I've just started publishing articles for um, various for a website in the UK it's a, a website called Total Knowledge it's just started up and they were looking for new writers again I'm not getting paid for it but I'm getting that experience and I'm making a name for myself as a writer and I'm getting lots of good feedback from that as well again just by um I write the article, this website publishes it, you spread it around on Twitter, Facebook or whatever, and loads of people are reading those things as well. And so again, my name, not necessarily my book, but my name is being put out there and you know, it could go down the way of kind of like the Dan Browns of this world and as soon as that name becomes recognisable, you start looking out for the product. At least that's the that's the plan in my head anyway. Yeah. Um it's it's just a matter of perseverance and if you're if you are a writer and you enjoy writing that's what you're in for at the end of the day um, and if money does come by towards you then I think you are you're in a really lucky position um, but there are still loads of really successful self-published writers that have never signed a deal with a publishing contract or with an agent they're still doing everything themselves because it works for them and they've made a massive success out of that way as well so even though the potential to get published through an actual 
publisher or through an agent is still there going self-published is is definitely becoming a more viable way of making a name for yourself as a writer there's accounts on twitter and on facebook um that will actually sit down and read your book for you and then post reviews for you on on amazon or waterstones wherever it is you have published so you you put in the cost for sending them the copy of the book and then they if they like it they put on they go on there and they do a good review for you and that's happened for me several times wow um so a- again there's that there's that thing to consider about self-promotion you there are there are people out there who love reading books and they will sit on there and they will blog about it and they will tweet about it if they like the book they will link your book into their twitter page or blog page or whatever it is that means that their audience will go away and have a look at your book. It means that you're now out of your circle of friends or family. And again, it's taken that next step. So um, obviously you've, you've talked about um, your experience with, with writing your first book. Um, obviously it's, it's your chance now to you know, tell everyone about it. I mean, in a brief synopsis, what, what would you say that, you, that your first book was about? The first book is basically about a guy who um, is, a, is a radio DJ in London and he looks like he's got the the perfect life there um but he's probably one of the most unhappiest people you will ever meet in your life and then he he gets the opportunity to go to his town where he was born for like a a university reunion 10 years after and he knows there's going to be some people there that he needs to go and make amends with and he thinks that that's going to going to going to fix his um fix his his personal problems and it's just it's it's kind of the same old story about a guy who's who's stuck in a rut and is trying to go on a journey of self-discovery. But there are a few twists and turns in there, and uh, and hopefully a lot of a lot of humour that people appreciate as well. Okay, brilliant. And um, and whereabouts can you get the, the book from? It's on Amazon for you now. So if you just type in the word um, "getting synced" and then "synced" is spelled S Y. N K apostrophe D. That's fantastic. Is is there anything uh, that we haven't talked about which you think is a burning bit of advice for anyone who is starting out in in writing a book or, or getting their first book published? First thing you need to do: write the book. Don't worry about anything else. Don't worry about how it's going to be promoted or anything. Just write the book, the book that you want to write, and you make sure you're happy with it. When you're happy with it, then you worry about getting it published. And you you go away and you talk to as many people as you can. When you've got it published, promote it like anything. It's it's going to be your... If you believe in it that much and you want people to read it, it's down to you to promote it. That's the key thing you have to remember. And at the end of the day, no matter what happens, just enjoy it. Enjoy writing the book and enjoy hearing other people read it as well and giving you that praise for something that you've done. Brilliant. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Stephen Paul Blanchard, thank you so much for talking to me via Skype today. You're more than welcome, Bob Smith. It was a pleasure. As I said, that's Stephen Paul Blanchard, and his book, Getting Synced, is available on Amazon, or you can Google Stephen Paul Blanchard. Stephen, by the way, is spelt with a PH, uh, and you can find lots of information about Stephen. Uh, He joined us via Skype. If you do want to ring us on Skype, then our Skype username is Radiopod UK. And don't forget, if you're in the UK, you can also text us. Just text LJ. N-E-H, followed by your text and send it to 60777 um, and of course anywhere you are you can uh, email us providing you've got the internet studio at radiopod.co.uk and we've had a couple more emails in uh, in the past couple of minutes or so. Uh, one here from Lauren Brenda, who says, Hi all, great show. I'm currently writing. I'm actually writing while listening to this show. Great. Are you getting inspiration? I hope so. That's what it's all about. Um, she says, Could I suggest short sprints of time writing? This is how I tend to write, as I have a relatively short attention span which is kind of pretty much like me, what I was saying earlier on. Um, She continues, Also, there is such a thing called National Novel Writing Month, which happens in November, with two slightly different ones this month and in April. So that's worth Googling. Uh, National Novel Writing Month. Uh, So thank you very much, Lauren Brenda. And another email here from, where has it gone? Nigel Roland Hicks, who says, I thought you might be interested in my experiences with self-publishing for your programme. Some people prefer hotels. Motorhome novices tour Cornwall by Nigel Roland Hicks. Okay. Oh, so that was the title. It's quite a long title. So it's some some people prefer hotels, motorhome novices tour Cornwall. Uh, He says, I've always been an avid reader, Uh, particularly enjoying memoirs, nostalgia, travel and humour. And for a long time, it was an ambition of mine to write something on my own. 
but what? Inspiration came after we bought a motorhome whilst driving to Cornwall on our first ever trip. During torrential rain, my windscreen wiper packed up. We endured 24 hours of rotten weather, cooped up in our confined space with Monty, our faithful border terrier, no. and bless, surrounded by dripping wet weather gear and muddy boots, and no doubt a smelly dog smell as well, because uh, when they get wet, they smell, don't mm. they? Um, Nigel continues, I encountered a wobbly campsite WC pan... <laughs> Oops, and temperamental showers, and started to think that buying the motorhome was a terrible mistake. Thankfully, the weather improved, but as my wife, M and I got to explore some of Cornwall's most idyllic and historic places, some for the first time and others we'd been to before, if something could go wrong, it generally did. So he continues, I wrote down everything that happened, and when a grumpy old work colleague said he'd only ever stay in hotels... I knew I had a catchy title. Some people prefer hotels, motorhome novices tour Cornwall, and started to write in earnest. The result isn't simply a travelogue, it's full of humour, and as well as writing about the places we visited, the farcical situations we found ourselves in, and my crotchety observations about our campsite experiences, I also go on a personal inner journey as sentimental old memories were triggered off by our motorhome holiday. That was the easy part. Having written the first draft, I kept trying to improve it, improve it again and again and prove it yet again then i emailed a chapter at a time to a very good friend and literate friend who found all the silly mistakes i just couldn't see for looking uh then when i was finally satisfied i got hold a copy of current the current writers and artists yearbook and wrote a synopsis which i started to send off to publishers and literary agents however if i was lucky i would get back a pre-printed thank you but no thank you slip and often received no acknowledgement whatsoever uh, Nigel continues, uh, all very frustrating, but having written the book, I wanted people to read it, so looked into self-publishing, which I'd heard so many bad things about. I came across Matador Publishers, uh, which were recommended by Harry Bingham, author of The Writer's and Artist's Guide to Getting Published. Unlike the majority of self-publishers, Matador actually seeks to sell self-published books and won't publish anything they don't consider to be up to scratch. Nigel continues on to page two. Um, anyhow, I invested a fair amount of money in getting my manuscript professionally copy edited, a quirky cover illustrated drawn up, and 1,500 copies run off. I also got my own website sorted out and figured if I could make the 100,000 or so motorhome owners in the UK aware of my book, I ought to be able to sell them. I, sorry, I ought to be able to sell sell them. Yes, yeah, sorry. My bad reading. The mind writing. <laughs> uh, near the end of the writing process, I informed the Motorhome magazines Practical Motorhome and MMM, the Camping and Caravan Caravanning Club and Caravan Club, that I was writing the book and sent them ring-bound manuscripts asking if they could have a quick read through. Give me a comment and I could use on the book cover. So obviously, you know, like testimonial sort of thing. Most importantly, once published, consider featuring the book in their magazines. I later offered copies for competition prizes. Mm. Practical Motorhome were great and said the author's travel writing is well observed and his engaging motorhome experiences will no doubt ring true with many of our readers and other motorhomes, uh, which I used on the back cover. They also ran a full page feature and another smaller one in the Christmas edition. The Caravan and Camping Club magazine also featured it, but I was disappointed that the car uh, Camping Club and MMM didn't pick up on it. Boo. Uh, later on at a motorhome show, I joined the Motor Caravanners Club, which uh, ran a full page feature and then asked me to write regular articles, which I've enjoyed. So this is, it's a springboard into different things yeah. as well, isn't it? Not just writing your own book, it can lead on to other things. Um, uh, he, can, he just sums up basically, anyhow, it's been a long learning curve, and in hindsight, I should have ordered less books. Even so, it's a great feeling when someone buys a copy, but I still have a long way to go. So that was Nigel Roland Hicks, um, and you can uh, log on to his website to see all about his book, which is somepeoplepreferhotels.co.uk. And of course, writing is something that is a passion for people. Some people can make a career out of it, but some, they prefer to stick to it as a hobby. Our next guest is Terry Ann Sherwood. She took to social media to find like-minded people who love writing. She started a writer's group on Facebook, the group is called The Writer's Chest. Originally, it started out because I was looking for a, a writing group that was local to my area, and I couldn't find one. So I thought, why not just start a group that was online that people from sort of everywhere, all over the world or the country could come and join, and we could do like an online writing group, um, which started working out really well, actually. What sort of things do you do on there? People offer sort of tips and advice that they may have about writing or... They might share some of their work that they're currently, 
you know, working on a story, they'll they'll share it onto the page. And then members will offer sort of honest feedback and critique to sort of help each other out, really. And we also hold writing exercises. So we'll hold like a like a Facebook event that will last maybe three or four weeks. And it will be, you know, a brief so everyone can work to the same set brief. So it's like write 800 words on the same sort of theme and it's that's really good because then again you know everybody sort of reads each other's what they've come up with and they'll critique it and it's lovely to read all the sort of different ideas that sparked from the same brief it's like an online writing class really that must be quite a lot of work to actually keep up how, how do you find time for that well basically i'm a full-time carer so what i do is you know i'm always at home anyway so it's actually it works out better for me and writing such a solitary hobby so for people to be able to just log on to Facebook and be able to have a quick chat to other writers whilst they're at home doing their things quite a useful tool really and I've got a couple of other members that help me add a minute it's not that much work people are quite friendly it's very much a group where the group kind of goes itself or everybody it's like a community everyone puts in something to get something out of it so it's it's not too much hard work what do you get out of writing probably the same thing i get out of reading really which is it's that whole thing of escapism it's quite nice to just sort of drift off into another world and with writing you have the power to create that other world it's quite exciting when maybe you don't know where your story is going but you've created such a strong character that they tell you where their story is going it's quite a, an exciting and therapeutic process so along with the sort of therapeutic process have you ever thought about becoming published i would love to become a published writer one day um i need probably a lot more discipline to get my bum in the seat and pen to paper a bit more often myself but yeah i've got a collection of short stories that i've started that i need to write more for um, and I've got some poetry and stuff that I've written as well. So one day maybe I'd love to sort of self-publish those. So with with the Facebook group, have you had much feedback from other members of the group? Yeah, people seem to be really enjoying it. The best thing that's come out of it is with these writing exercises, quite a few members will, have come back and posted and saying, you know, this is the story I wrote for this week's exercise and I entered it into this competition and it, it won or... I've now had this story published and that's arisen from, you know, a writing exercise that we sort of held for the members. So that's really, really nice to hear that good things are happening from something that just started out of me wanting to chat to other writers. So you can find Terry's Facebook page at Facebook. You just search for The Writer's Chest. OK, remember, we've got our um, online poll at the moment on our website, which you can take part in and vote on. Uh, the question we're asking is, what's the best route to publish your book, self-publishing or a deal with a publisher? At the minute, it's at 100% self-publishing. Uh, so if you want to have your say and, and vote on that, so either self-publishing or deal with a publisher, uh, then go to radiopod.co.uk forward slash live. Uh, still to come, a lady who has had nine books published Published and has a contract with a publisher. So no doubt she was voting on our website. She'd go with deal with a publisher instead yes. of the self-publishing. Um, so there are obviously pros and cons with both of them. Uh, next um, is, is a chap that I, I caught up with, uh, Russell James Smith, who has six books currently available. They're a mixture of paperbacks and e-books and are a mix of science fiction and supernatural thrillers. And they're all self-published. But as he explains, that wasn't by choice. And what advice does he have? From my point of view, what I do when I finish a book is I try to get it conventionally published through an agent and I just keep approaching agents one after the other until I run out. And then when I've got nowhere left to turn, that's when I uh, turn to the self-publishing route. And it, the costs vary from from uh, publisher to publisher. I once paid about £1,600 to get something published, but then something else, it cost me um, a couple of hundred and with the ebook route, it's considerably cheaper, and I think it's the way to go. Really, you're more likely to be read, to be honest with you, with ebooks. If 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 an ebook costs a few pence or you know 50p, somebody will take a, a chance on it. Basically, I I find a list of agents and publishers because sometimes they approach the publisher. So if you get um, a writer's an artist's yearbook, I think it's called, um, it'll have all the names and addresses of literary agents and publishers in you've done a mixture of um paperbacks and 
purely digital downloads as well. Do you get feedback from those of how many have been downloaded or, or physical books have been sold from somewhere like Amazon, for example? You do get a statement from the publisher and it'll tell you how many you've, you've sold, but you don't normally find out what people think of it. Is there a difference in supplying something for download only than for an actual physical book or is it all kind of the same process when it was a physical copy the, the, the physical books um i was sent the manuscript back through the post the electronic version they sent an email back to they sent, emailed the file back to me um and in in microsoft word they'd made not changes but i can't remember what it's called but it's underlined and then you you, you sort of right click on it and then there's their suggestion and you can either approve it accept or ignore it basically and then they want ideas for the cover they they will design a cover for you but i think they prefer it if you come up with ideas yourself when you were first um looking at getting um your very first book published was there any help or advice that you could actually follow to get there or did you have to work it all out yourself i did work it all out myself but there are books out there if you've got the time get advice there's plenty and plenty plenty of books out there stupidly i didn't i just sort of thought well this is what i want to do this is how i'm doing it but i don't think i've made any grave errors i just don't think i've written the um the masterpiece that i've been trying to do so if somebody came to you wanting a bit of advice or if you could do it again what would you do different and what did you learn from it i think when i first started i just wasn't good enough you need to get on an honest opinion for what you need somebody to read what you've done and for them to be as honest as possible or read some fiction I, I I perhaps should have read more fiction when I was younger because they say if you want to write you need to read but whenever I get a chance I do pick up somebody's book open it in the middle and read about 10 pages and then that sort of focuses me and it can inspire you as well it, it can encourage you to sort of raise your game a little bit you know even if it's a different type of fiction you, you think to yourself, right? Well, these these have made it, so I need to be as good as the, as good as this, or better. Well, a friend of mine, he started writing, and he's read a book by Stephen King about writing, and he says it's really helpful. But I do think if you want to be a writer, then you must have some of it in you already. Are there plans for more books? And also, it does will it get to a point where? Um if you continue self-publishing you might stop doing it or does that spur you on to you know maybe keep trying even more yeah i think i'm going to just keep trying basically and you always think to yourself okay i may i may have done quite a few that I haven't really got anywhere but if i do get something published properly one day in the future then somebody might want to look at my sort of back catalog if somebody came to me and said if some genie appeared and said nothing you do will ever be read by anybody I think then maybe I'd stop but because you don't know you just sort of spurred on to keep going really Inspirational words by Russell James Smith he doesn't have a website but if you go to the book section of Amazon type in Russell James Smith sorry I forgot to say it properly Russell James Smith Vision Era then you'll find uh, one of his books. Other books include Tulpa, The Messenger and The Phenomenon, uh, which are also on Amazon. Amazon getting a good old plug today. Mm. Um, so, um, Jen, we, we've talked about self-publishing and obviously, you know, the other route that people want to go down is actually getting a, a proper publishing deal, you know, with a, a big, big company because they've got the power behind them and everything like that. But it's a, it's a confusing process and there are lots of people involved, not just you as a writer. Yes. The other people are involved along the way as well and it's, it is a bit confusing, isn't it? It is quite confusing. This is the simplest way that I can try and describe it. Um, essentially, you need four of you, the author, an agent, a publisher and a literary agent. Um, you, as the author, obviously you're the one who puts the words down. Um, and then you have to have your agent. They know who is looking for what. So they know what sorts of publishers are looking for um, thrillers or romantic comedies, that kind of thing. Um, then you need your literary agent. They are the buffer between the publisher and you, the author. They do all negotiating, so the costs and length of time and how many books you have to write a, a year, that kind of thing. And then there's the publisher. Now, they check your content um, to make sure that it's going to get to reach the 
biggest audience that it can um, and they safeguard your work as well and ultimately they get your book out there right i see brilliant thank you so much for the explanation about all of the different um <clears throat> what some would say barriers other people would say helping processes to get your book out there yes, um, yes. but it is a confusing process and you know for some people that is is the best way uh, for most people self-publishing i think is the best way uh, on the phone next is marina scott her maiden name was marina white and she's the author of junior handling the white way you say it was a maiden name mm, in the title you see uh, it was self-published and uh, she's agreed to share her experience hi marina how are you Hi, I'm okay. How are you? Not too bad. So please tell me about your story. Um, well, your, your story about your story. How did you get published? Well, um, I've actually had a, um, a book published back in 2001, now 2002, um, and it was sort of uh, a book all about dogs. But actually, it was very, very niche market that the book was about. Basically, if you, you've you heard of dog shows and, and things like crafts. Yes, yeah, yeah, definitely, um, yeah. Well, this book was actually about the young people's side of um, handling dogs. So there's a whole com- competition within dog shows um, called junior handling classes. And so that's where the young people aged between 6 and 16 are actually assessed on their ability uh, to show a dog. So that's kind of like a niche within a niche already. So it was an incredibly uh, specialist subject uh, to actually write about. And I decided to do it when I was about 18 in my gap year because um, I was well, become world champion, actually, in junior handling. So I felt like I had a lot of knowledge to give back. So I wanted to write it all down in my gap year and, and see where I went with that. Um, so obviously it was a really, really specialist subject. So we decided to, um, my dad and I um, decided to approach a publishing company called Ring Press, who are a pet book um, specialist publishers. Um, there'd only been one book ever written on junior handling before, and at the time, um, they were a little bit wary of taking on such a specialist subject, even though it was on pets and dogs and that. But like I explained before, it was so niche, I think they found that there was possibly going to be you know, a bit of a struggle for a market for it. But actually, it turned out to be a real... You know, success stories. I was really, really chuffed, and it still sells today. Um, I think about I do training days around the country with junior handlers, and last weekend in Kent, um, you know, I only had 14 handlers there, and all um, 10 of them already had my book. And actually, I went on to do a DVD version as well. Oh wow! And all 10 of them had my book already, and um, I only sold four in a day, which still surprised me because I think, well, it's nearly 13, 14 years old now, but all the content is still applies and st- is still the same today. And, and what did you have to supply to the publisher? What, what were their criteria? Um, it was really quite open at the time. I think because we went down the route of literally we were paying for them just to sort of print it. Um, we They obviously wanted to make sure and bind it all together and make sure that it was sort of really good quality book because they were renowned for doing very good quality ones. So I think the only thing that I had to do was I literally provided the content, i.e. the words, I provided diagrams, and I took all the photos in the book on just my little camera. We didn't have iPhone cameras that that were that good that net back in those <laughs> days. Um, and so, yeah, I provided the words, the photos, and diagrams, because this book was a factual book, so a lot of it needed explanation through diagrams. And I was sort of... Um, I wouldn't do them... I would do the wor- a Word document, obviously type that all up, and that would be emailed through to them. Photographs, then I think I sent all the originals to them, so they would scan them in at their end. Uh-huh. And then I would send um, diagrams, so I would actually draw them all out with red and blue pen. And I, w- I think I would send a lot of sort of design outlines to them as well. So, for example, what I wanted in my book, I wanted it to be really colourful. I wanted certain colours to be used on the front page. I wanted, instead of bullet points, I wanted, like, um, little paw prints. I wanted the, each chapter to be colour-coded, so in all, all different colours, so that when you were flicking through the book, it was just more colourful and eye-catching. So I, I sort of provided pretty much everything, and they just sort of designed it and then came back to me with, you know, big, I can't remember, I think they were, like, A5 sheets, um, or A3 sheets, I can't remember, but they were really big sheets of... The actual book and I would go through them page by page to see what I liked and what I disliked and then it would go back to them and they would sort of tweak the design and that sort of stuff and then we 
it got to the point where obviously we were both happy with it and then I think the final thing was they had a team of um, sub-editors who would then read through the entire book checking for mistakes and spelling and grammar and stuff and I think because I was only about 18 at the time you know, it probably wasn't as good as it is now <laughs> now I work in publishing but um, to be perfectly honest I probably if I had to write you know, junior handling the white way now it obviously wouldn't be the white way because <laughs> that was my maiden name but um, uh, I think if I did another one I've got quite a lot more notoriety and experience under my belt and I'm very well known in the dog show world so they possibly might jump at the chance to sort of for me to write another one and it might be different so that they pay all the upfront costs and they pay for it and then sort of earn money back on what was what is sold there's no doubt that we probably haven't met our costs back we're probably yeah we're not in a profit on it but I think what's come out of it you know a dvd's come out of it i've done 15 to 20 training days on the back of it i you know i present on telly and things like that so you know it was a really good thing to have on my cv and i still look back and think i can't believe i've you know as a published book author at, at the age of 19 I, it's, it was i still i still look back at it fondly and i still think today it's pretty amazing so the, one of the things that i do regret about it and this is more to do with the content was there was a section in it where um, we did sort of case histories with top handlers at the time who were, you know, the, well, the top handlers in the UK. And so I interviewed them and had nice photographs and things. That's the only thing that dates it, is because when you look at that now, you know, all of these young young handlers that are in the book are obviously all grown up and with, have perhaps have families and have moved on and perhaps not even in junior handling, or not in the dog world. But actually, the funny thing, the majority of them are... Um, but obviously that's the only thing that dates it. So I would say if you are going to, you know, publish a factual book, then just be aware of in 10, 20 years' time, if you're reading it, and it is a, a book on facts that, you know, there's some things that obviously rules and regulations might change over time, and the names of organisations as well might change. You know, I suppose it's exactly that. When you're writing any Facebook status, a lot of people you know, write what they're eating that night and what they're doing and, you know, when they've had a really bad day, they rant and all this sort of thing. I, I'm of the opinion that, you know, use Facebook for what it is. It's a great social communication tool, but you wouldn't want potential employers in 10, 15, 20 years' time seeing or reading what you've just put. So just make sure that when you're, same thing when you're publishing a book, make sure that it's as up-to-date as it possibly can be. But if you are using photographs, and things like that. I mean, just try it. Yeah, I, I suppose even if you're photographing a computer, obviously in 10 years' time, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's going to look different to what it is in another 10 years' time. You can't help things dating, but just try and think about sort of the products and the items and things that you're using in it. Uh, well, listen, Marina Scott, who used to be Marina White, hence the name of the book, <laughs> The White Way, uh, thank you so much for your advice today. No problem, thanks. Thanks for asking me. So if you love dogs and in particular have uh, kids who want to get into dog handling, uh, then Junior Handling The White Way is available from Marina's website at juniorhandling.co.uk. Uh, still to come, going to be chatting to a lady in Las Vegas who has a few movie producers mm-hmm. sniffing around her book at the minute, which would be great if uh, it gets you know made into a big, big movie. So hear her story very soon. Uh, we heard earlier on from Martin Coleman, who actually uh, printed his own books. He didn't even necessarily go down the self-publishing route as in contacting a company to print them for him. He found a printer himself, and he he did all of that himself, found an illustrator himself, did the whole process. Um, And I've been flicking through a business magazine and actually found a great article by a company who basically say how to print your book, and they give some great advice. Would you like to hear some? Mm, Yes, please. Right. So, um, as a lady, Jen, you would have um, probably heard that size is very important. It's been said. Yes. So the actual size of your book and the number of pages you are considering will play a big part in the value for money element of your project. Uh, This is the article by a chap called Alan Bunter, who's the MD of Remus Limited. Uh, He says, if you can make your book fit a more available paper size and you're flexible on the number of pages you're writing, uh, you'll be able to save money. Uh, Colour is the big one. The more colour you have, uh, it becomes more expensive, basically. Hmm. But you can be clever with colour and get more value for money by letting colour fall on the right page pages then it will come at minimal cost Uh, he then goes on paper different types of paper can lift and brighten up images or it can dull the text so you need to choose your paper carefully also different papers work better for different print processes therefore careful consideration on how it will be printed is essential 
Uh, then he goes on to the actual printing itself. Uh, this could depend on your content, but basically if the quantity you require is small, uh, then from a cost point of view you would look at digital printing but for lar larger quantities uh, and the best quality then litho printing is the best mm. and then finally it's all about the binding as well uh, most people choose uh, perfect bound uh, which is like a paperback book and the fastest and most cost effective method PUR bound which appears the same but is more durable will have the pages sewn into one block and they can never come loose so you've all I don't know if you have taken a book apart before, but if a book over time becomes a bit tatty, you've seen the, the stitching inside and how they... I've done it on a holiday where I've left it in the sun and it's melted. Ah, right. Well, there you go then. Yeah, that's that's that process. Um, and he says, this is the most durable method, but also the most expensive. Finally, there is a case bound, which involves making a hard case, sewing the pages together and then casing in the book blocks similar to encyclopedias and dictionaries as well. So, uh, yeah, there's a few tips there from Alan Bunter, MD of Remus Limited, and uh, their website, if you are wanting to find a printer to do it yourself, uh, is their website is shortrunbooks.co.uk. OK, and if you don't want to go down the self-published route and you, you are determined to get the published book then Alice Peterson is the person you need to listen to. She's our next guest and she's been writing as a career for many many years um, and she has a contract with um, a publisher's Quercus. It wasn't always her plan to become a writer though so let's find out how she got into it. I used to be a tennis player and I played tennis passionately from the age of 12 to 18 and I was one of the top 10 juniors in the country by the time I was 18 and then, um, very sadly, overnight, I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, which is an autoimmune condition, and there's no cure. And it was the last thing I was expecting, but it, this was the diagnosis, and it absolutely shattered my dreams of becoming a tennis professional. And to cut a very long story short, in the end, I, I went to university, came out, and I wasn't sure what to do. I was very uncertain of my future. And a friend um, encouraged me to write my story about my, my tennis. And then being somebody young, living with a very difficult condition, such as RA, he said, you know, you've got a story to tell, why don't you write it down? And I didn't dream that this would be the beginning of a career. It was just incredibly therapeutic to begin with. But then as the story unfolded and I really enjoyed the creative side and I loved writing each chapter, and showing it to him, um, it began to be a, a story, it began to be a book, and he said, well, we've got the, the choice now, do we try and send it to a publisher, or is it just an exercise that's helped you? And I went down the first route and sent it to a literary agent, and literary agents then sell it to publishers, and, and that was the beginning of something really exciting when we, when we were given a, a deal with, with Macmillan. And how did it feel when he first sort of said, is this something you want to take further? I felt very excited. I, had, I was completely ignorant about the publishing industry at that stage, which was probably no bad thing. I didn't know how competitive it was. But I do remember feeling incredibly excited because I was so unwell, you know, that I, I couldn't play tennis anymore. I was in terrible pain. But the suggestion that Robert, Robert was his name, it, it sort of gave me hope and it gave me something to really focus on uh, it was a goal, and also I'm, you know, I'm deeply competitive, and I haven't lost that. And I really, so I really wanted to make it work. And I think also the fact that I loved the writing so much. I mean, funny enough, when I look back, I, I wrote diaries from the age of ten, so I loved writing. And um, at school, I loved writing the drama plays. I never wanted to be the actor. My God, you know, that'd be far too nerve-wracking. I liked writing the stories. So in a way, it, writing was quite natural for me. It, was just, it just felt like such a great challenge, and I really loved the distraction of it. it. It didn't take the pain away with the RA, but it just sort of gave me something really positive to think about. And of course, when we did get the deal with Macmillan, I, did, I, I just remember feeling so exhilarated and proud and hopeful you know, for, for the future, and that was the first time I really felt that way since being diagnosed. And was it a really daunting process to get started with, with the literary agents and things? It wasn't daunting because, I, as I sort of said, at that stage, I didn't know enough about it. And I, I was quite lucky. My, the first agent that we approached, I um, was lucky because I, I had done my research and I, and I looked up um, in the Writers and Artists Yearbook names of agents and what they liked and what they specialised in. And she, she liked personal stories. So I knew that my story might 
be appealing to her. Um, but I was lucky to get an agent first time. So I thought, you know, rather ignorantly, oh, this is quite, this is okay, I can do this. Having been in the publishing industry now for um, about, well, maybe 20, well, 15 years, there have been so many ups and downs within that time and rejections and mm. disappointment and then wonderful, you know, achievement as well and, you know, getting the deals. So it's a real roller coaster of a ride. Um, but at, at the time when I was doing it, I just kind of went, went with it and um, I did have the support of my friend who was really encouraging and that helped. So no, and, and, and then when, once you get an agent, they're very nurturing. So you get an agent and they, they won't take a penny from you. They, they don't charge you anything. They, they are saying, I have faith in your work, I have faith in you as an author, and I think I can sell your book. You know, getting an agent is sort of half the battle, really. And then they're the ones that do all the, all the negotiating with a publisher, and they, so, so you've got them protecting you too. So do you know roughly how many books you sold for the first time you published? Um, no, I think it did a print run of about 15,000. Um, for um, A Will to Win was my very first book about the tennis. So that was fairly, you know, not too little, but not huge either. I was a first-time writer, um, so I was quite pleased with that. What was that like to know that sort of 15,000 people, uh, that that many people had your book and they could read it? (laughs) Oh, it was great. And and honestly, there's nothing nicer than getting a message from somebody who says, I really loved your book or I just absolutely love feedback and I love knowing that my books are being read and, and it's one of the best things about writing is when somebody says I just your book made me laugh or it made me cry or it's helped me in some way especially my first book which was so personal you know I, I wrote about the rheumatoid arthritis because you know young people do get do get it and I wanted to sort of really raise awareness of it and also show that you know life's not over when you get a life-changing condition so and, and not to feel so alone as well so when people responded to me saying you know it's really helped me and I don't feel so alone anymore that that in itself is I means so much more to me really than how many copies I sell it's just it's just lovely to 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 get that kind of response how many have you written um to date I'm on my sixth novel now so I've done nine books so far Wow, could you ever have imagined sort of 20 years ago that that would be the case? No, no, <laughs> not at all. I didn't really know what to think. And No, it's wonderful. I love, I love my job. I'm really happy. It's had its ups and downs. And I definitely think being a writer, you have to be quite thick-skinned because there are real lows when you get rejection or, you know, like any, like any business, it's fairly ruthless. But I wouldn't swap it for the world because the highs have been worth it and and getting a deal and seeing your book on the bookshelf or you know see, seeing someone read it on the tube uh mm-hmm. i've seen that once and i remember being so excited um what did you then, do in that situation <laughs> oh i wanted to scream i actually had to get out and i couldn't talk to her she was too far away but i a friend of mine once said that they'd seen somebody reading one of my books on their Kindle, and she did tap them and say, "By the way, that's my great friend's oh. book." <laughs> I was really, I was really pleased. I, and every now and then, friends say, "I saw somebody reading your book on the beach," and they, and they, they told them. But that, you know, that's um, it, 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 yeah. The, the best thing about writing is when the publisher sends you the book for the first time. So it's the very first time you see it in physical form. That mm. so you've been writing it for months, researching it for months, editing it, you know, endlessly. And then, and then finally, that brown parcel comes in the post, and you unwrap it and you pick up the book. And there's nothing, honestly, there's nothing better. And this um, is all happening again for you in a few months. Yes. Well, I, I was thinking about that. My book should arrive really soon. I've got a book coming out in September called One Step Close to You, and that we're really close to that stage of getting the book because we need to send it out to for publicity. So I just can't wait to see it. It, I'm never less excited just because I've done it before. If anything, I find it even more exciting. (laughs) It's sort of like a birthday present when you see your book. So when you start the Mm -hmm. next book, how long does it take to do the research and actually put it all together, writing as well? Um, It varies. I mean, one of my books, like Monday to Friday Man, which was the dog-walking comedy, um... That really didn't need very much research. It was just a very lovely, straightforward, romantic comedy set in um, 
set in a park in London, two characters fall in love, but things get in the way. You know, that that wasn't a hugely... It was a, a much more straightforward. But then my last book, By My Side, about um, canine partners, these dogs that assist people with disability, I had to do an enormous amount of research. And... Um, I really loved doing that. I visited the puppy centre, I saw the training, and then I, I, I met many people with different kinds of conditions, like MS or spinal cord injury, and they told me how much a dog had transformed their lives. Mm. And I really went into it in huge detail. And by my side is a story again. It's a love story about this girl who has a spinal cord injury and thinks her life is completely over until she gets Ticket, this wonderful, loyal, golden Labrador assistant dog, and mm. very gradually she begins to lead a different life, fall in love. But it was all the issues around that that I found interesting about how family, do family immediately accept somebody in a wheelchair, you know, the, all, the, all the prejudices. I did, I did an enormous amount of research, and I found it really rewarding you know, when you deal with subjects that are as complex as disability or spinal cord injury, I, I have to do it justice. So mm. the research was absolutely crucial before I started writing. I imagine when you start writing the, these, these books, you actually get so lost in it that it just becomes, it consumes you and it becomes your world. Is that the case? Yes, absolutely. Yes, you do. Because in a way, I remember um, being given advice by um, Diana Beaumont. I remember she said, when you choose a topic for your book or an uh, ideal subject, you've got to feel passionate about it because you're going to live with it for the next 18 months. Mm. And that was such good advice because you really are. And so for that period of time, you do eat, breathe. You know, they become, they become very real to you. And they, almost, they become your friends, even the bad characters. Um, mm. And you, you, I become very attached to them. And I do find that when I'm very involved in, in a book and when I, you know, I'm in a, in a role and I'm writing, you know, a couple of thousand words a day, I do find it quite difficult to switch off sometimes and go out and see friends. I'm, I'm always got that notepad in my hand thinking, I just wonder if I could <laughs> do something about that or, oh, that's a good idea. She could say that, you know, <laughs> you do become a bit, and my friends see that look in my eye and they go, oh my God, what are you rushing down now, you know. <laughs> They're always terrified I'm going to write something down that they've said. But, yeah, you do become quite obsessed. And it's, it's always quite a relief when you finish the book because you think, well, I need a, a, I need a bit of a break <laughs> from them. But it's fine. It, it's fine. It's, I find it exciting when you feel like that because you, really, you know that you're really into the story. If, if you don't feel like that, I don't think you're writing the right story, actually. And with, with the different books that you've, you've written, is there a standard amount of time that you'll kind of say, no, I have to have it done by then? Or do you let it ride its course? Um, well, I'm, I am contracted to do one a year. P Quercus published me, and they're fantastic. I, I do have deadlines. They do, you know, I'm written, there is a deadline in my contract. So I can't just be completely, oh, well, you know, this is taking longer than I thought, never mind. Okay. I am aware of a time, but that's, that's fine. And actually, it, it's better to have a deadline. I think if I didn't have one, I, I could bit less focused maybe but um no I, i'm I'm, so, I'm i'm aware that i have to finish it by x and that that's good when you started out it was kind of a, a fun passion and mm -hmm. now obviously you just mentioned about sort of contracted does that add different types of pressures to you that make it less fun or is it still the same for you the writing i know what you mean when you've got a contract you do feel a bit more pressured especially when you're trying to think of a new idea, you think, oh, I really have to think of a new idea. Mm. You've got the security on one hand of a publisher, which is wonderful, because, you know, I haven't had a publisher all the time. I've been in and out, in and out of, of writing contracts, which is, again, quite natural with writing. You don't, just because you get a deal, or no, doesn't mean you're going to get a deal for every book you write. So you've got the security when you've got the deal, but you've still got to have that hunger. Mm. Um, and I do, I do. I definitely think it's, it's lovely when you have a publisher because you get to know the editors so well and uh, they are really supportive while you write. So you're not nearly so alone as when you're just writing without that deal and without mm. that input from a publishing house or an agent. No, I, I don't enjoy it any less. 
if I had to say, it's, it's so much nicer when you know you've got that deal because you feel secure and much more confident in a way. And how about the future? You've got the book coming out in September. What's what's next after that? I'm writing a a, a, rom- a romantic comedy, so that's na- that's next. And I'm I'm finishing that up at the moment mm-hmm. because it's quite a wide gap. Even though I've got a book coming out in September, it was finished some time ago. So it takes a while for by the time the script lands on the publisher's desk, it takes a while for the for the script to then become a book. So in that time, I've been writing another story. So I'm at the almost almost finished that and it's being read by my agent at the moment so we'll wait and see what she thinks so plenty of brown paper packages arriving on your doorstep in the future yeah Yeah, can't wait That's Alice Peterson. She's an author of Another Alice and Monday to Friday Man and plenty of other titles. You can find out all about her at www.alicepeterson.co.uk. Now, today we're talking about how to get a book published, but Radiopod is a unique station broadcasting specialist shows about hobbies, interests, memories, special events, training, advice and your opinions. Basically anything. Um, If you have a subject which you would like to hear on Radiopod, then you can let us know. Send us an email in info at radiopod.co.uk or you can use the online form by going to radiopod.co.uk forward slash ideas and remember you can get interactive with us anytime on facebook and twitter please check out our facebook page please like it um, and also check out our our twitter feed Uh, we do post regular updates and information Uh, so facebook.com forward slash radiopod uk and twitter.com forward slash radiopod uk now a lady who goes by the pseudonym crystal clary joins me via skype in Latin. Las Vegas and a fascinating yet sad story. Crystal's best friend was murdered by a serial killer when they were younger so Crystal has decided to write about it in a self-published book called Signs of a Serial Killer. It's a story which throughout warns you um, of the signs to look out for. She's also writing her second right now, her second story. Crystal, the Skype quality isn't great from America right now so we'll keep this brief but you were writing from an early age, is that right? Um, Actually, uh, one of the uh, interesting things I, I actually put it in my story is that when I was younger I used to write all the time I used to do poems and songs and stories and the friend that uh, that was killed by the serial killer used to read them and, and tell me if, I, if it was good or if I should change it and um, actually act, after she went missing and then we found out that she had passed away um, I actually quit writing because I I didn't realize it, but on a subconscious level, I was afraid to go there because uh, I had lost her and it just hurt really bad. And it took many years. Um, My son actually got published a couple of his poems before I actually started thinking, gee, maybe I should start writing again. And um, and so I started writing. And the the wonderful thing about writing this book, uh, first of all, I know it's going to help a lot of of women and uh, children. families to help protect their their, uh, their families from these type of predators. Um, so it was difficult to write uh, because it is a true story and I had to write an omniscient to try to um, distance myself a little bit in my writing because every time I said I, I did this and she did that, I would start crying so it was much easier to say um, Crystal Clary did this and it was easier for me. Um, and I've had two um, producers uh, talk to me about possibly making a movie about it. How, how close is it to being reality that it could be made into a movie? Um, it, it is, uh, it's a possibility. You know, I'm actually uh, uh, working on my second book, but now I've decided to also um, get more detailed um, in a, uh, to, to write the actual uh, screenplay. Okay, and, and how did um, the, the movie producers actually find out about your book? Is, is it just something that they, they found on Amazon and decided to read themselves and thought, hey, this would be a great idea for a movie? Or did you, you know, sort of push the idea towards them? Um, actually, I hadn't, uh, I hadn't approached them. They both had approached me. So um, I thought to myself, wow, you know, if I, if I really want to do this, I would really um, think that uh, Sean Connery would be would be good at that. He's done so many things that I really enjoyed. I thought that he would do a good job with it. So um, he has not approached me, which uh, I'm hoping that once I get this um, in a fashion that he could possibly do that. 
then um, I would hopefully uh, send him a copy and see how he feels about it. What would you say that you've learned and would would do differently in getting your second book published compared to your first? Um, I think that what I would do differently is um, you definitely want to make sure that you go through your book um, and do at least 10 drafts. Um, I think I would be very, very meticulous um, about that. And I would suggest that, that you don't worry about what other people think. You know, do it for yourself, um, knowing that there are people just like you out there that would enjoy that. Fantastic. And we're keeping our fingers crossed, and we're going to look out for the movie Signs of a Serial Killer, hopefully starring <laughs> Sean Connery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in some fashion. Crystal, thank you for taking the time to talk to, to, talk to us. That was uh, from Las Vegas uh, in America, obviously. Uh, Signs of a Serial Killer by Crystal Clary is available by typing in Signs of a Serial Killer on Amazon. Uh, so you're listening to Radio Pod. Uh, today's show is how to get your book published. And uh, it was going to be for, well, one hour. We've kind of overrun slightly. But, hey, some great calls that we've had on and, and a lot of great advice as well. Uh, if you are um, just venturing out on the you know, in the world of writing your own book or if you've just finished your book and are wondering whether to go down the self-publishing route or, you know, try and get a book deal. Hmm. Um, I mean, e- either way, I mean, there's a lot of advice out there and, you know, it's it's not one size fits all. All the information is there for you to consume and then sort of, you know, take it on from there, really, isn't it, Jen? So. Yeah, and what about the newbie people? What about those people? Well, um, on the phone next, I do actually have a newbie. Uh, her oh. name is Michelle Reed, and uh, she's uh, new to all of this and has her first ebook out. Hello, how are you? Hello, I'm fine, thank you. Excellent. Now, tell me about um, what you've done, you know, what, what you've published and how you went about it. Um, well, I've just published my, I uh, self-published my um, first book about two weeks ago. Um, it's actually been three years in the making. Um, I, I mean, I've been uh, sending out uh, submissions to agents for about two years, trying to get an agent with l- little success. So um, I decided to uh, jump into the self-publishing world. Um, initially, it was a bit scary because... Um, at the time, I thought it was a bit of a cop out because, like many people, I dreamed of having an agent and getting a publishing deal. But actually, self-publishing is a blessing in disguise, as I, I get to keep all the control and the royalties over my work. Is it what you expected, or is it a bit kind of a bit more daunting than what you expected? Uh, nothing what I expected at all. I mean, when I started writing, it was just for fun. I didn't even think about you know going into it seriously. But then about two years ago, I decided to go into it. And it's only once you really start, you know what's actually involved in everything. I'd never thought, you know, just from reading books yourself years ago, that what's involved in everything, whichever path you take, um, even self-publishing, it's, it is hard work. Um, not to put anyone off, but you've really got to be committed to do it because there's a lot of work on yourself. Um, you know, you're not relying on anybody else at all. And it just comes down to even editing and things. I mean, lots of people pay for services for people to edit their books for them. I personally didn't. I edited it all myself. Um, I didn't want to pay out a lot of money for it. It it is hard work, but it is quite rewarding at the end as well because, you know, it's all your own work and nobody else has had any input in that. And, And if you could actually do it all over again, if you could actually sort of step outside of your body and look at yourself and, mm-hmm. and tell yourself, you know, a, a bit of advice about that first book that you, you published now that you've kind of gone through it, mm-hmm. uh, what, what would you say to yourself or, or to any new person who's come along and, and, and doing it? Um, well, I personally stressed out quite a bit with it. So I would say try to take it as it comes, have a bit of fun with it and don't stress out because it, it can be, because it's all all your own work and you're having to do everything. I mean, I'm not very technology-minded, so I'm not very good with computers and things like that. So that was quite daunting for me as well. But I've learned so much. So in a way, I wouldn't change anything because I've learned a lot more than I ever thought I would through doing that. And where did you actually go to, you know, make your dream a reality? I mean, did you search on the internet for, for companies that, that publish uh, books? or? How did well, you know yeah, it? I mean, I, I became friends with a lot of authors online and figured out what they were doing. There's quite a lot of different um, avenues you can use. There's a, a Smashwords, there's Create Space, um, and then there's Amazon themselves. And I researched all of them work out which one was the best for me and I decided to go with Amazon because they're the biggest funds in the world really they're the biggest coverage 
So uh, they, they were the best ones for me. So it's a lot of joining forums and chatting with other people, seeing what works for other people to work out what, what will work for you, really. And obviously you, you said it's only been two weeks. I mean, have you had any sales so far? How How's it been going? Yeah, yeah. I've, I've sold quite a few in the last two weeks. I mean, that's not without me, you know, really promoting it. And I, I join every website going to put my name out there, you know, really annoy people and things like that. I mean, a lot of friends and family obviously have bought it, but you, ha- you, you eventually got to start relying on word of mouth for your book to get out there, you know, into the wider world. Yeah. I mean, luckily like, with, with me, with Amazon, it is worldwide and I've had quite a lot of success in America as well. Um, it, it depends on your genre, I suppose, and things like that and what kind of book you're writing and no, no, I've had I've had quite good success in the last two weeks, that's for sure. Okay, you mentioned about um, genre. T- actually, tell me about you know what your book is. What, what's it about? What genre? Okay, uh, well, it's difficult to really pinpoint because that's probably why an agent hasn't picked me up. But my my book is um, it's a romantic time slip novel, I'd call it. Wow. Okay. Uh, because it yeah, it starts in the 21st century. Uh, following uh, my main character, the lady, she wakes up basically in the 19th century in England. And it's all about. I, I, I'm a huge fan of Jane Austen, so I, you know, I have dreams and fantasies of being in 19th century England. That would be brilliant for me. With, with Doctor so, Who. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So she wakes up in the 19th century, basically, and has to. So it's a, a modern woman living in, you know, a, a 19th century world and having to work out what's going on and things like that. So you can imagine quite a few scenarios. Uh, I mean, obviously you've written your book, but um, you know mm-hmm. this is material for your second book, and feel free to use it. You know, but um, <laughs> she's in the nineteenth century. It's like, OMG, where's my phone? LOL. And it's like, well, exactly. And what is what I'm talking well. about? You know. <laughs> yeah, there is a lot because there's no modern technology and things like that, which to me would be brilliant because <laughs> yeah. I don't like modern technology. Oh much. right, okay. Um, and that's why I like to, to think of going back to a simpler time. You know, things like that. Um, but this book is actually a trilogy I turned into because the, the story sort of wouldn't leave me alone. So uh, it's just this is the first one that's out at the moment. And, and where can we get your book from? Uh, well, it's on Amazon at the moment. It's called Long Lost, and it's up for one ninety nine, so it's quite a bargain. Brilliant. Um, yeah, and you can download it off there, and it's available worldwide. <laughs> Brilliant. And when you actually, um, you know, kind of got your book onto Amazon, was it a simple mm-hmm. process to actually get everything like uploaded? Was, was it as simple as like a Word document with a couple of JPEGs? Uh, yeah, yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for me, I, I went the long way around. I, I don't try, tend to trust myself sometimes, so I pay somebody to format my book, and it didn't actually work out well. And I put it onto Amazon, and then I had a few people contacting me, telling me it's not, it doesn't look right. So I had to look at it, and so it was all wrong. So I had to format it all again myself. So it depends, really, because I'm not technology minded. It was a bit difficult for me. Yeah. But otherwise, it's, it is a case of just once your file is sorted, you can upload it. It takes well, they say it can take up to 48 hours. It took me six hours for it to go live. Wow, brilliant! And then, it, and then that's it. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, listen, I, mm. I, I wish you all the best with it, and thank you so much for talking to me today. That's great. Thank you for having me. <laughs> That's Michelle Reed, who is a newbie to the literary world. You can get her ebook on Amazon. It's a romantic time slip novel, and it's called Long Lost. Sounds really good, actually. Um, I'd just like to personally thank everybody who took part in the show today and passed on lots of different advice as well. Uh, Remember, the show is available to download as a podcast to listen as many times as you like as of tomorrow at radiopod.co.uk. Thank you for listening to another Radiopod special sponsored by equaldating.co.uk. Today's show will be available to download very soon. Log on to radiopod.co.uk to listen again and find out which shows are coming up. Radiopod, get into it.